Welcome to Friends in Fiction, five best-selling authors and the stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, Patty Callahan Henry, and Mary Alice Monroe are five longtime friends with more than 80 published books to their credit. In 2020, they created Friends in Fiction to provide author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing, and to highlight independent bookstores. These friends discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Hi, everyone. It is, Hi. it is a Wednesday night, and that means it's time for Friends and Fiction. We are so happy you're here with us, and we hope you are having a great week so far. I'm Kristen Harmel. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey. I'm Patty Callahan Henry. This and I'm the new one. The new one. <laughs> Friends in Fiction. Tonight, we have not only a special guest coming on, but we also have a special guest host, the one and only Christina McMorris, who we all adore. Hi, Christina. Oh, hi. Hi, Christina. It is so great to have you with us. So, of course, Mary Alice is on sabbatical and Mary Kay is on vacation. So, when we're down two Marys, the only logical option is to add another Kristen or Christy to keep things confusing. So we did our absolute best and we landed on a Christina. So Patty, I'm afraid you are outnumbered. <laughs> so tonight, along with our dear friend Christina, Christy, Patty, and I are excited to welcome New York Times bestselling author Lauren Willig, whose latest Band of Sisters just came out a few months ago. We'll be talking about the book and also about her fabulous frequent collaborations with Karen White and Beatrice Williams, her hugely popular Pink Carnation series, and how she so adeptly balances work and life, which is a tightrope walk many of us are doing right now. And falling off of that yes, and falling you. off repeatedly. I, I'm falling <laughs> off. And I have to say, until Lauren gets here, and I am the odd man out, I think we sound like a band. Mm -hmm. P-Cal yeah. and the Christies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I like what that. Do you well, we P were Cal supposed to be Mary and the Christie, so don't tell Mary Alice. I would vote for them. <laughs> it's P. Cal and the Christies. Well, and Tony said it's Patty and the Christies. How, how come we always get we always get relegated to being the back with the backup singers? What's right. with that, you guys? Can well, it just be I don't know. the Christies with Patty? I mean, yeah, yeah. it could. <laughs> it doesn't have as good a ring, though. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I sorry. will agree. I mean, you know, I, I don't want to be a backup singer necessarily with this <laughs> stunning vocal. Um, Same. You know, same. <laughs> we're like the Supremes. So there we, gotta you go. on, we gotta work on our dance though. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll practice my tambourine since it's the only thing I play. So as always, it is so important for us to remind you about supporting independent bookstores. And tonight we are highlighting Shakespeare and Company on Lexington Avenue in New York City. And I know there's one in Paris, but tonight we're talking about the one in New York City, and we will be telling you more about them in a little while. We also are so excited because we have a brand new partner this week that we all love, our friends at Caroline's Cakes, who want you to take a bite out of summer with them and with us. Doesn't that look just um, oh, oh, good. cake and so wine? Great. So great. <laughs> um, but all month long, each of us will be telling you about our beach bag must-haves, our favorite reads of the summer, our ideal Labor Day weekend, and of course, our favorite Caroline's Cake Bites flavor. And here's the best part. We are offering you a chance to win the ultimate Labor Day weekend beach bag, brimming with swag from Friends in Fiction and Caroline's, including 10 books and an order of Caroline's Cake Bites in the flavor of your choice. So make sure you're following us individually on Facebook and Instagram for chances to enter all month long. The Cake Bites are incredible and i'm kind of wondering if i'm eligible mm, to win yeah good points so yeah. i am in um north carolina right now and i went to the farmer's market near me and they had a whole bunch of caroline's cakes no way today. yeah and i was like 
those, those, those are our people. Yeah. So before I get too carried away talking about cake and especially their <laughs> gluten-free coconut one, um, Christina, since we have you on the hook, you thought you were just here to co-host, but we have you on the hook. So we'd love to ask you about what you are working on now because rumor has it and we hear the rumors, trust me, mm -hmm. that you have a book coming out soon. And I know that all gajillion people who fell in love with Sold <laughs> on a Monday are eagerly waiting to hear what you're working on next. So can you tell us and dispel the rumors and set us straight? <laughs> Um, I think that nobody is more eager than my editor. <laughs> because it's not what are you working on now? Kristen and I, we talked about this earlier today. It's what am I still working on? <laughs> it's so sad. Um, I will say, though, before I jump into that, that I am so happy to know. And hopefully Lauren's listening to this because I just discovered on a Facebook post the other day when Lauren, I think of her as a machine. like the three of you as well. And she just, I don't know how she juggles everything that she does. Yeah. It's insane. And so when she posted the other day that commenting about somebody complimenting her, she said, oh, people, I'm a year late with my next book. And I went, oh my God, I have You're no human. idea. You're human. I'm a year late with my book. So yes, so I, I feel better now. I do feel a little bit better now in our lameness. Um, <laughs> Perfection takes time. Yeah. And this past year, right? I mean, goodness, we can all yeah. agree. This is insane. So yes, I can finally tell you a little bit more. Um, I am turning this book in, hopefully, knock on wood, on Monday. So just a couple <laughs> more days. So this is really fun because as soon as I jump off here, I'll be writing all night. Um, so it is called The Ways We Hide. And historical oh. fiction again. Um, what a great title! Yay! Good. I'm so glad you like it because we went through about a bazillion. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. Was, yeah, remember? Yes. Remember. Kristen and I used to text her all the time. We brainstorm. So yes, that's the <laughs> title. Yay! And um, and it is. Gosh, I will tell you guys. I'll come back and visit if you guys have me back sometime, and I will tell you way more when I have books to give away and all that. Um, for now, I can tell you that it without giving away too much. It um, it should come out to next August is what we're slated for. That's awesome. And so we got one more year, which in normal people's world feels like forever, but we all know, right? That's really fast for us. Yeah. So, That's a blink of an eye. Yeah, yeah so fast. Uh, so historical fiction, World War II, which I haven't been back to um, my, in my books in a couple books. And um, the reason I wrote about it is because I came across an article years ago that was that was about World War II, about a British military intelligence group that I had never heard of. Mm -hmm. And it, their skill sets and the people they recruited were so unique and unusual that it sounds stranger than fiction. And it has inspired other movies that people have no idea that they are tied to, which is so cool. And the things that they did and created are things that you all have in your homes. You you still use them today. Your kids use them and you have no idea that they used them the way they did. Wow, and it, it was so successful actually that they kept it classified a lot of their work until 1985 because they thought they might have, have to use it against the Russians during the Cold War. Whoa. So that inspired a story that and a mix of a female illusionist that is somehow tied to this whole group. Isn't so that awesome. Oh, I know. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. I remember. Did you ever think about using the word illusionist? I love that word. The title. Oh, trust me. We went through all <laughs> of those too. Kristen I, knows. You talk, I, You told us about this when we were all in San Diego, yeah, right? Yes, yeah. I remember this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I we were talking about a few different things when you were in Beaufort, and then you had sort of like decided, and I was like, oh. Thank That's you. Awesome. Oh my gosh, that was 500 pages ago. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, okay. I remember that vaguely. Vaguely, vaguely. That's it hilarious. Time, but it was, I mean, it, I mean, that, it's a big story. It's a big idea. Like that wasn't something you could just turn over. Yeah. So. Yeah, we can't though. wait. We, we can't wait. wait to read it. I know I cannot wait to read it. Um, yeah. So, you know, early looks were available here yeah. for. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, every week, yeah. you guys, we partner with Parade Magazine Online. We stream from their Facebook page live during the show, and we have an original essay in their online magazine every week. 
this year, I mean, this year, <laughs> this week, Kristen Ray like yeah. writes a beautiful letter to her son, Noah, about what she hopes he learns as he starts mm -hmm. kindergarten next week. And I was like crying in the car reading it just for a minute. And then Will's starting fourth grade, which is insane. Uh, but you can find it linked on our Facebook page and our Instagram bio. So Kristen, can you tell us about this beautiful Yes. Episode? Let's just have a quick chat about it because I want to move on and bring Lauren okay. on. But you guys, I'm going to need major your moral support next week mm -hmm. because Noah yep. starts kindergarten on Tuesday. I'm seriously beside Amazing. myself. Mm -hmm. So this so week bad. for parade, I know I can't believe it. Um, I sat down and wrote him a letter about what I hope he learns beyond the actual lessons he'll find in books. So of course you can find that essay on parade.com as Christy said. Now, Christy and Christina, you both have school aged kids and Patty, mm -hmm. your granddaughter Bridget is not too far away from the beginning of her school journey. What are some lessons that you hope they take away from this school year and bring with them always. And maybe just keep it quick so we can bring Lauren on. Yeah. Ladies, how about you, Christina? Yeah, so, um, gosh, you know, don't bite other kids. <laughs> don't bite other kids. <laughs> don't bite. Let's, let's start with that. That is my, that is my nephew. And, That's um, awesome. He was not a biter until he went to kindergarten. Oh, okay. so hilarious. One but, more thing to worry about now. Yeah, but, <laughs> he learned very quickly, you know, about conflict resolution. So that is something we can all agree that biting is bad and you have to come to compromises. <laughs> okay. Um, I love that. I, I just, I think your, your whole life, you know, you're, you're working with people who are different than you, who don't communicate the way you do, who don't do things the way that you do, who don't look like you or act like you or think like you. And I think that's one of the greatest things about school is that it, it sets you up for ever for being able to, you know, work with people and understand people and like people and be involved with people who um, you might not necessarily have thought were going to be like your person. And so I, I just love that because I think that's such a good life lesson and we use it forever. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. I love that. Um, I didn't write a letter when my kids went to kindergarten, but you've inspired me. I'll probably write one to my granddaughter, but I did write a letter to all of them when they went to college. Oh, and awesome. I remember going halfway through my son's freshman year and he had, oh my God, I'm going to cry. He had my letter on his bulletin board in oh his room. Gosh. And it was still in the envelope, but it obviously had opened it and read and, um, Something happened a couple months later and he texted me and quoted part of that letter. So oh, Kristen, yes. that letter, you need to save it forever because he doesn't know the impact right yeah. now, but he will, he will. I love that. And well, you know what, let me, that just reminded me, I'll insert one thing that on a serious note, yeah. <laughs> so, but so, although biting is serious, um, serious. <laughs> is, and this will be really good. I just thought of this, um, that you could start when he starts to going to school or the end of the year, yeah. what I started what I started doing, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, what I started doing, they can't hear me. What I started doing when they were a couple into about second, third grade, but I backed up to kindergarten and I bought Oh, The Places You'll Go by oh, Dr. Seuss, yeah. which usually you give as a high school present, right? Yeah. But I saw online that somebody had done this so cool. Starting at kindergarten, you have their teachers or their counselors, everybody they loved at the end of the year, you ask them who were their favorite teachers of the year. And they all write a note in that book and they that. don't know it. But I'm giving my, my oldest is a senior, so he gets it next year. Oh, oh that's great. chill bomb. So that's amazing. Idea. It was oh such gosh, a good I idea I stole. So much. It really is. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. All right, everyone. So you know that our guest tonight, Lauren Willig, also has two young kids. So I bet she has some thoughts on this too. Maybe we'll touch on motherhood and parenthood a little bit with her tonight. So let's take a moment to introduce her and then we will bring her on. Patty, you want to get us started? Yes, Lauren is the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of more than 20, 20 works of historical fiction, including Band of Sisters, The Summer Country, The English Wife. I love that title, The English Wife, yeah. by the way. The Rita Award winning Pink Carnation series and three novels co written with Beatrice Williams and Karen White. Wow. Her books have been translated into more than a dozen languages, picked for a Book of the Month Club, awarded the Rita Booksellers Best and Golden Leaf Awards, and chosen for the American Library Association's annual list of the best genre fiction. 
And she's also an alumna of Yale University, just that little school that you may have heard of. Yeah. Um, yeah. That little dink, that dinky place because she couldn't get in anywhere else. Um, yeah. Lauren exactly. Hedlund. Poor thing. Oh my gosh. And then Overachiever has a graduate degree in history from Harvard and a JD from Harvard Law School. Okay, I'm already feeling stupid. Yeah, <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. welcome. Yeah, we feel like that every week lately. Oh I feel God. like, right? <laughs> like this is, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of depressed now. Okay, she lives in New York yeah. City yeah. with her husband and two young children that we'll talk about. And a few fun facts. Lauren has also spent a year doing dissertation research, total slacker lady, in yeah. London. And she actually signed her first book contract during her first month of law school, where I imagine she had loads and loads and loads of time on her hands for writing. I mean, how hard can Harvard Law School Sorry. actually be? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Al Woods was like planning mixers while she was yeah. doing it. Yeah. True, yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. looking yeah. super cute. And that's super bikini. Yeah. She actually practiced law as litigation associate for a year and a half at a big firm in New York before leaving to write full time, at which point she began teaching a class at Yale called Reading the Regency Romance, which was an exploration of the rise and development of the Regency Romance subgenre, something Lauren knew a little bit about by then. Her latest novel, Band of Sisters, tells the true story of the Women's Relief Unit of Smith College, which traveled to France during World War I to help rebuild war-torn villages. But let's let her tell us all about it. Sean, can we bring Lauren on? Hey, Hi, Lauren! Lauren. Oh my gosh, thank you so Hi. much for that lovely introduction. <laughs> we're so excited and a little bit intimidated that you're here with us because after that introduction, we're all like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just need to be bored. <laughs> So, Lauren, before we take a deep dive into your world as a writer, will you give everyone a quick description of Band of Sisters? Sure. Band of Sisters is based on the true story of the Smith College Relief Unit, a group of determined Smith College alumni who went off to France at the height of World War I to bring humanitarian aid to villagers right behind the front line. So these women battled, you know, German shells, French bureaucracy, recalcitrant livestock, and a group of British officers who were like, hi, women are a war zone, what are you doing here? And we're like, hi, we're just saving people. So that's the story. It's based on thousands and thousands of letters home by the real women who did this, which are in the archives of Smith College, who were just, they were the most amazing people. And luckily for me, also amazing letter writers. Awesome. Well, I am glad that you mentioned that because that is one of the things we wanted to ask you about today. So a quick note to everyone out there, please put your questions in the comments on Facebook or YouTube, wherever you're watching us, and we will try to get to a couple of them tonight. So Lauren, you are so well known for the vast amount of research you do for your novels. I mean, I feel like it's been that way since the beginning of your career. And of course, Band of Sisters is no exception. Can you talk a little bit about how you came across this story of the Smith College Relief Unit? and about the research you did. And I really do specifically want to hear about the letters because I think that's just such an just such an interesting component of how you put this book together. My gosh, thank you. And you sort of like all the best things this book happened to me totally by accident. So mm -hmm. as um, the gals here yeah. mentioned, in addition to writing my own books, I also co-write with two really good friends, Beatrice Williams and Karen White. And so we wrote a little book set in three quiet, calm time periods in French history, World War I, World War II, and the 1960s. And for the World War I bit, we needed to know about Christmas in Picardy under the German occupation. Like specifically, we needed to know whether a certain type of pickered Christmas cake would have been available under the Germans. And so, you know, because this is a thing that will haunt you, there will be that one reader yes, who for the rest yes. of their life will be like, but in 1914, they didn't have the cake. And so yeah, I'm yes. just Googling like Pickard, Picardy, Christmas, World War One, and up popped this memoir by a Smith alumna talking about throwing Christmas parties for villagers in 1917. I'm like, Huh? Because it sounded, it read like fiction. It sounded crazy. Like this yeah. group of long skirted smithies out there dressing up, I kid you not, as Father Christmas and hooking toys on fishing line for the kids to pull out of a decorative screen. I'm like, someone made this up. So of course I dropped everything because, you know, procrastination is my middle name. And I read the whole <laughs> memoir. I was like, oh my God, this happened. This is real. Someone That's must true. have written about these people. And I went digging and there were no secondary sources it kind of blew my mind that no one had written the story. There were these two memoirs. There was a pamphlet 
which told their story through bits of their letters. And it had been put together in the 1960s and sort of Vanity published. And it was, you could tell the letters were really heavily edited. And there was the Smith College Alumni Quarterly, which had printed bits of their letters home in real time. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing, but there are gaps in the story. There was stuff where you could just see the ellipses and yeah. you could cut the juicy bits out. And oh, so wow. Smith College has this amazing library guide online. And I saw that they had letter collections from the members of the original Smith College Relief Unit. I thought, okay, I have these questions, like such questions. Like one woman had talked about this horrible thing that she had seen that changed her whole life and made her decide to go home and accept her boyfriend's proposal. I'm like, oh my God, what's a horrible thing? And even more importantly, their director, the woman who had the brainstorm for this whole unit, like this was her baby. A week after they get to their headquarters, she suddenly resigns and leaves. And there's no oh. in any, like the dot, dot, dot does not cover this. I'm like, why do you know? Because <laughs> um, they're like, her health, but nothing had been said about her health before. I'm like, okay, there's a story, something happened. So I emailed the archivist at Smith College. I was like, so I see you have these letters and you say you can digitize things because I have a one-year-old and a five-year-old and I don't think I can make it to the archives. Could you send me these letter collections? And they're like, do you know how many pages that is? And I was thinking what? like 10 pages and a picture postcard of Paris. Because <laughs> I've done archival research before and sometimes you would get really excited because you're like, oh my God, there's a letter collection. And you get there and it's someone's laundry list. Or my favorite was when I was doing my dissertation, I trekked out to the University of Nottingham archives, actually fell down a hill in the process, but that's all other story. <laughs> and there was supposed to be the the memoir, the journal of this prime royalist who had helped King Charles escape from ca captivity and then got him captured again. I'm like, finally, I'll get the inside scoop. I got there and his journal was there, but it was entirely about his struggle with his hemorrhoids. So <laughs> five letters, a postcard and something about someone's hemorrhoids. And the, archiv the archivist was like, look, we're happy to digitize this stuff for you, but you realize that's over a thousand pages. Oh I was like, my gosh. Oh my goodness. Okay. And wow. I spent a reading through, and it was not a journal about someone's hemorrhoids. It was actually like the day to day stuff <laughs> they've been doing, the answers to mom. All of my questions were there. It was every novelist's dream of the cache of papers you hope you'll find, but never do. Yeah. And it was amazing. So I don't know if you guys know, I was lucky enough to get an early copy of the book, and uh, it was just such a good story and beautiful. And I love that what you and the three W's do all the time, right? It's just, it's, and all the women here that bring, um, that bring female protagonists, especially, especially from like the historical of us, bring the history of, of kind of these unsung heroes that we just never heard about that got lost to history. And I, I just absolutely love that. So, and as you may not, as well, so you know, so I was a Wick Morris, right? And when we, when we did events oh, I mean, together, I was the bold W. <laughs> We just flip your name upside down so you're with more with worse. Right. Absolutely. All right. So speaking of hemorrhoids, I do have a follow-up question for you. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Okay. Totally different question. Um, so I know you have two young kids and minor. that does tie into hemorrhoids, yes. Yes, exactly. So speaking of, <laughs> and we'll bring it's like um, we'd like to tell you two who our sponsor is for tonight. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. So we're all moms, and so we know, <laughs> we all know firsthand, as you all know, because we're all punchy at this point, um, how tough it can be to balance with writing, which is insane how you do what you do. So can you talk to us a bit about how you have found some balance? Do we, do we laugh through that? Balance between yeah. mom life and writing life, and over the last year and a half, especially with all the craziness going on, and especially because in New York, where you live, where essentially you guys were locked down. Yeah. yeah. So tell oh, us yes. about that. I mean, I, I do think balance is kind of a joke. So I was a published <laughs> author for a decade before I had my first child. And I had these beautiful primrose ideas fueled, fueled by horrible people who were like, don't worry, you can write while the baby naps. So before she was born, I set up my desk. I mean, you guys can laugh at me really hard. I sat at my desk in her nursery because I was like, she will be napping like a little angel in the crib and I can hear her gentle breathing while I write deathless prose. <laughs> and I also, I called my agent 
who also didn't have kids. I'm like, you know, I'm worried I'm going to use the baby as an excuse to slack. So I think we should double my writing schedule because I work better when I'm overcommitted. And so that's why I signed up to write a pink carnation book a year because I was still writing that series and a standalone book a year. And then oh added on a couple of novellas for anthologies and then a little bit later, the Team W books. So, and then my child was born and thought that napping was something that happened to other people. I was yeah. like, oh my God, <laughs> I have underestimated all the mothers in my life for so long. Because I had just had this idea that moms just were really organized people. And that like somehow once you got your mom badge, you became able to do the work of 10. And this was just something that happened. And actually what really happens is you are so punchy with sleep deprivation that you do all sorts of things because you don't even realize you're doing them. And you were so <laughs> high on decaf coffee because you're not allowed to have actual caffeine. <laughs> anyway, so as for balance, you know, my balance comes of having other people deal with my children for me. And I feel like it's important to be blunt about that. Like when my child was a baby and I had a book due, my older one was a baby and I had a book due, my mother would come over every day and hold her while she napped for three hours while I went off wow. to Starbucks. Cause I had a book due two months. I turned in a book right before she was born. And I had a book due two months after. And I wound up getting a three month extension. I turned in when she was five months old. And that only happened because my mother was there Amazing. every day holding yeah. her for three hours a day. Yeah. And so I think this year, you know, especially we went into lockdown on March 11th, a day that she'll live in infamy. My first and best purchase was a Nespresso machine that kept me and my family alive through those dark days when we were locked in our apartment. Um, but I think it really exposed the fault lines in working motherhood in America and how hard it is to juggle. I got Band of Sisters done on two hours a day because my husband has one of those finance jobs where you do not take time off for kids. So yeah. our solution yeah. was lunchtime from 11 to one when people might sort of be assumed to be, you know, I don't know, lunching, he would take the kids and I would lock myself in the bedroom with, with my double Nespresso pod and write a chapter a day that way. And that's wow. how- Chapter a day, oh my gosh. That's amazing. It's amazing what you could do with um, adrenaline and Nespresso. And Nespresso. But not something I yeah, wow. recommend. And you know, as Christine and I were talking about, you know, I was like, you know, when that happened, I was like, oh my God, I am superwoman. I can do anything on two hours a day. But that only worked so long as I thought lockdown was going to lift eventually. Right. And I had another book due. And somehow there were always, you know, my husband had work crises and my two hours, I was like, okay, don't worry, I'll cover. I don't need my two hours a day today. And things just kind of got lost. And then by the time I started to get some work time back, I was so burned out that I couldn't focus. And so, and also the archives at Smith College I needed were closed, but that's really an excuse. I think it was really more the, I think it's very hard to get back from childcare mode into work mode yes. once you've been thrown off your schedule. Yeah. And you're hard to reclaim that time, especially when you spend all your time scrolling through CNN reading like horrific things are happening. Yes, the world was true. on fire. I mean, yeah. it was on fire to literally to focus for two hours a day when the world is burning over here. Yeah. It was really like when, hard. When the world was really burning, in some ways it was easier because I could hear the sirens outside my window. We hadn't left our apartment and everything was hypercharged. And yeah. the thing is Band of Sisters dovetailed with it because yeah. there I was while these horrific historic events were happening, writing mm -hmm. about women who were going through these horrific historic events, but who were pulling together and coming out on top and finding yeah. the good in people. And the, the creepiest, spookiest thing was for a little bit, I was writing about the exact same day. So like on March 21st, oh, 2020, wow. I wound up writing about March 21st, 1918. And oh, it was wow. eerie, but I took so much comfort from it. Wow. Yeah. I think that kind of adrenaline only gets you so far and then eventually yeah. you crash. But what happens when the crisis yeah. keeps going? Yes. Yeah. We burn, we burn out. It's yes, hard. Exactly. Yeah. It does. And you still finished it. So bravo, it Lauren. And bravo. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's well, amazing. Yeah. Well, the, the real casualty was the the following book. Because after this, I was like, I'm going to write that next book. I plunged right into the research for it. And then I hit the snag of the Smith Archives being closed. And then my two hours disappeared. Yeah. And it just sort of dragged and dragged and dragged. And my adrenaline, my adrenaline ran out. So, yeah. 
I, I can relate to that because I chose this year to do my first part historical novel and had all this these grand ideas of all these places I was going to go research and how I was going to be, you know, elbows deep and all of these things. And then the world shut down. And it was like, thank the Lord for librarians, because yeah. like, what would we have done? I mean, it was crazy. Um, but anyway, um, thank you for sharing all of that, because it's not always easy. And um, but you you pulled it out and it's amazing. Um, but you are also so well known for your sweeping pink carnation series, which Library Journal called the best literary bouquet ever created. And reviewer Bobby, Bobby Dumas called genre bridging in a piece for NPR. She goes on to say, I call them genre bridging because they satisfy romance fans who love the pinch in the chest, soul satisfying, all is well in the world, happy ever after denouement. But they also have such densely detailed and gratifying historical swashbuckling spy based plots that <laughs> non romance fans love too. What a review. I mean, that Jeez, I know. I know. Yes. So, first, can you tell us a bit about that series, which takes place between 1803 and 1808? It also has a modern day storyline. And did you mean them to be genre bridging? You know, they, they were another great example of things that happen when you intend to do something else. So mm -hmm. I had really, I went off to grad school thinking I was going to write those big doorstop historical fiction novels, you know, Gone with the Wind, The Thorn Birds, Through a Glass Darkly. The and I, was gonna, I know, doesn't everyone love The Thorn Birds? Um, but I was going to, I was going to use my PhD to write because my, my field was Tudor Stewart, England. I was going to write this, this, thousand page long 17th century epic. But there I was, I was a third year grad student grading student papers, you know, getting these emails from students being like, oh my God, you gave me a B plus, my life is over. And I needed to do something for fun. So just for fun, I wrote this swashbuckling romp about spies during the Napoleonic Wars. Cause I grew up on the Scarlet Pimpernel and Zorro, but I had questions. Like, how does a heroine not realize who he is behind the mask? And like, <laughs> why does the Scarlet Pimpernel have it so easy with Marguerite? I mean, she could give him so much more trouble. So this was really, this was my sanity saver, was my Napoleonic romp, which was sort of a mix of the Scarlet Pimpernel and Georgia Hire and Blackadder and sheep jokes and sort of whatever came to my mind at the moment because it was just my mental health project and it was meant to be silly and a spoof. But the weird thing was, a friend of mine, I, you know, I passed it around my friends to my friends because it was full of these in jokes. And a friend gave it to her friend who was an agent. And I got this random call from a guy who's like, I'm an agent and I really love your book. I want to represent you. I'm like, who are you? And spilled coffee all over myself. <laughs> I don't know how Pinkarnation happened. It was a book that was never meant to be published. And you know the frame story was really you know I was this was the heyday of chiclet. We're talking two thousand one, two thousand two, and I had just come back from my dissertation year in London, where I had lived in a basement flat and not met a cute Englishman and not found like a cache <laughs> of amazing secret sources. Instead, I was like trekking after people's journals about their seventeenth century hemorrhoids, and so I wrote this wish fulfillment frame about an American grad student in London who meets this and incredibly handsome blonde Englishman who happens to have a cache of family papers that tells her everything she wanted to know. And my grad school friends got really into it. They're like, put in how like advisors never answer your emails. And so it was like <laughs> all my grad school stuff and all the awesome. dating stuff. And now it reads like a time capsule. It kind of cracks me up, but that was my life back then. Mm -hmm. And so it was this frame, they were my, what was the old coffee couple like Maxwell House where they had those commercials where the romance would progress by like two minute intervals over years and years. That was my modern frame. And so somehow this became like the vanguard of the dual timeline movement, even though it was really just this weird chiclet swashbuckler mashup that wasn't intended to be anything in particular. That's amazing. So Amazing. we need, of course, talk. We already mentioned about the three W's, and so now we get to talk. Let's circle back to them because I am, I'm dying to know how you guys fight. <laughs> no, actually, I know I don't think you ever do actually. Um, but for those of you who don't know about the three W's book, oh my goodness! So of course their last names. I'll start with W, and they've written all the ways we say good, said goodbye, the glass ocean, and the forgotten room, and those are all with New York Times bestselling authors Karen White and Beatrice Williams. So can you tell us a little bit then, besides the whole fighting part, which we really want to know about, we do um, know. 
how, how you work together mm -hmm. and collaborating like that, the how the rhythm of collaboration works um, with the three of you all working on your own projects at the same time, which is insane mm -hmm. in itself, amazing, mm -hmm. and how you balance that to, to do both at the same time. Well, there's a lot of Prosecco involved. Actually, it's very funny because we like to tell people that we weren't put together like the Spice Girls. We're all genuine W's. And that was part of how we got together because we were all authors. We were all on the circuit. And you get seated by alphabet at book signings. Ah. We're always thrown together. And we're like, oh, my gosh, we are just each other's soul sisters. And one night we got really drunk at a conference. And we're like, oh, my God, if we wrote a book together, our publisher would pair a barbell and we could travel together. And um, when we sobered up, we were like, wait, <laughs> we can actually really do this. And our publishers and our agents thought this was the worst idea they had ever heard. Really? Oh, no, they were like. I'm so surprised. Really? <laughs> I mean, part of it may be that when we stumbled out drunk out of the bar, we ran into Karen's editor and we sort of, we slurred, oh my God, we have the best idea ever. We're going to write this book together and it's going to be 50 shades of plaid. So when we went back and we were like, we're going to write this book, she's like, not the Scottish erotica. And we're like, oh, no, we swear, not the Scottish erotica. But it's going to be a book, and we're it's going to be triple timeline because dual timelines is what we do, and we're going to write it together. And our agents were all like, "You are aware you're all under contract for other books." And my agent was like, "You're aware you're under contract for a lot of books, and you're behind on most of them because this was you know, the baby effect because I just had my daughter and." I feel like, but no, please, we really, really, really want to do it. And so we were like a pity buy. And no one thought it was going to work. And they kept being like, so it's an anthology. And we're like, no, it's one book, but three authors. And I will never forget when we sent the manuscript into our editor. And she's like, this is actually good. <laughs> You sound so surprised, but you know it, it, we had a lot of trouble with this because the sales force, our our editor will call us and be like, the sales force doesn't know how to sell it because there are three names on the cover, and we're like, it's still a novel. There are three of us, but it's still a novel. We swear. It's still so a novel. When, when that first book, The Forgotten Room, came out and it hit the USA list and the USA Today and New York Times in the first week, they suddenly looked up and they were like, actually, you know what? Maybe this actually works. Three authors came out one book. We're like, yes, thank you. Also, please pay our barbell. That's awesome. That's how we balance. So the funny thing is, we found that you know, despite what our agents thought, the weird thing is, it feels like there's more time in the day when we're working together. And I think it's because we all always hit those dry spells in our own books. You know, those bits yeah. where you're stuck, where you're like, oh my god, I'm writing the wrong book. I don't know what I'm doing. All my previous books are a fluke. I have no idea how to do this thing. Yes. And that's yes. when your Team W chapter lands on your, you know, in your inbox because we write yeah. round robin. And it's like, and writing the chapter for the group is so freeing because you know your friends have your back. You know that if you write something really stupid and hopeless, they will gently tell you and that their stuff will be good. So your stuff is only one third. So even if one third is crappy, two thirds are good. So I'll be okay. <laughs> And so the team, and actually, so I just wrote, we were in the final round of chapters for our latest, our fourth collaboration. I just wrote my chapter in one day. Because that's what happens when you're in on the Team W role. And it's like, wow, how do I write this fast? Can't I write this fast always? But you yeah. can't really. But yeah, we sort of emerge energized for our own projects. And so it actually, instead of taking away time, it kind of feels like it gives us extra time and energy. That's awesome. That's amazing. It's and true. I think, I think <laughs> for all of us, what someone's saying, you can't do that. We just, we're doubling like, down. Oh, really? Oh, hell yeah. yes. really? You think we can't do that? Let me show you. So that's a great story. We had a couple of comments popping up, but that's a great story. So you have also written about, okay, the Napoleonic era, the 1840s, World War I, World War II, modern day, Regency, I, Tudor, I, I don't even think I've hit them all. So <laughs> can you just talk a little bit about why you have been drawn to so many historical periods? Mm -hmm. You haven't kind of rooted down in one, which makes me think, not only am, am I curious why, but do you think because they're set in different eras, there's maybe one overarching theme 
or message that ties them together and bubbles up? Ooh, that's a really good question. And one no one has actually ever asked me before. You know, I think part of it is this is the reason I realized I would make a really crappy academic historian is I'm a historical magpie. You know, I'll see some of like these behind the front lines and be like, ooh, shiny. I want to read about that. And so I sort of dart around from shiny thing to shiny thing, whereas by my, my dissertation, by the way, was on three years of the English Civil War. I spent seven years working on it. Oh my so gosh. This is sort of the <laughs> antidote to that. This is like, okay, my last book was World War I. Now I'm gonna go over to the Greco-Turkish War in 1897. And I can do that as a historical fiction author and be like, ooh, bright, shiny, and get to read all these amazing things and research them and call it work. And that's an incredible wow. gift. But as just sort of, the, oh, the irony though is like, I always intended that like, once I wrote my pink series and you know, played in the Napoleonic Wars for a while, if I ever wrote anything else, I would go back and write my giant 17th century epic. I kept promising I would write. And then instead I wrote a book set in 1920s Kenya. And then once in 1840s London, and like every time I'm like, I'm gonna write my English Civil War epic, something else pops up and I write that instead. So I've written like about everything except my actual time period. Um, but the theme that ties them all together is what I think of as the, but women did principle. Because one thing that drove me nuts and still drives me nuts is the idea that there is now and there was then. And in then women didn't do anything. That women had no rights, they had no agency, and that's just plain wrong. I think it's less, and although in some ways it's comfortable to think of it as a telos, where you start at one point and you move to another, it's actually more of a helix, which goes round and round and round. That for example, women had a hell of a lot more freedom in the Georgian period in the 18th century than they had in the mid 19th, at sort of the heart, height of the Victorian angel of the hearth theory. And one yeah. thing that fascinated me so much about researching Band of Sisters and my World War I women is that this is a time when the world was opening up for women. And these women right. were like, we can do anything and we can prove to the world we can do anything. That part of the reason for their mission to France was A, to convince people that women deserve the vote and B, to show the world that American women were equal to anything and could be in any profession and do anything. And they had this idea that everything was opening in front of them. Whereas, and I have not worked extensively in World War II. I know many of you have, especially you, Christina. It, I get the sense that World War II, the end of World War II is the opposite it's things are closing instead of opening. Mm -hmm. And that even though like with Band of Sisters, even though horrible things were happening, they're going out there with the feeling that they are opening up the world to them mm -hmm. and their younger sisters. And they and you know and things do open up. I mean, the 1920s are when the first barristers are admitted to the bar in England and women get into all sorts of professions they didn't before. But you know, what fascinated me is that no one knows about these women or if any of the other female relief groups, we've written them out of history. We've written the things they did out of history. And we've yeah. written the idea that women of that era had that kind of agency and power out of history. And I found this again and again and again in various time periods. And so that's, you know, I think that's the theme that connects all of my work is the finding out the things women actually did, the power they actually had and putting it there well footnoted on the page. I love when those themes bubble up. And sometimes, and I bet you would say this, some of your books, you didn't realize that was the theme. Your your magpie self saw this shiny object. And then about halfway through, you're like, oh, here it is again. That theme. It's amazing the way this stuff just yep. keeps popping back yes. out. I mean, and it's funny, I got my start <laughs> back in college. I was a Renaissance studies major and my specialty was the Queen Regent of Scotland, Marie de Guise. But I spent my time writing about female monarchs, about women who oh, wow. exerted power over all the men in their wake. And that was a great oh. era of female monarchs. And so it amazed me when I look at other time periods that, you know, there is this idea that women didn't have that kind of power. But if you look, if you scratch the surface, you'll find in so many ways they did. And so that's what I'm doing. I'm scratching that surface and bringing those stories back up so we can sort of readjust our idea of what women did and what women were capable of in earlier eras. That's incredible. And I cannot imagine like just 
ever, I feel like everything that you read and everything you pick up on is just like a new little idea. That's so exciting for you historical fiction queens. I'm kind of like the odd man out tonight here. This is, <laughs> but Lauren, you chose Shakespeare and Company on Lexington Avenue in New York as your local independent bookseller. Can you talk to us a little bit about why you love them so much? Well, partially they are my local dealer. They're on my path to my son's preschool. So they are in that dangerous place where it's like, oh, I'll just pop in for a quick cup of coffee before pickup. And then like the stroller basket fills up with more books. But yeah, they are they are a wonderful story. They have, you know, back in the before times, and I hope someday again soon, they do really marvelous events. Um, some of my happiest times have been in that basement at Shakespeare and Company, both as an audience member and as a panelist. And they're just lovely and always have a book recommendation or you know an online seminar on hand. And so I encourage everyone to check them out. Awesome. Now I need, not that I didn't need a trip to New York before, no. not that I wasn't already aching to get back to that That's fabulous true. city, but yeah. this bookstore sounds amazing. And they are they giving all happy. of you, Oh, do they? Okay. Well, do they have an espresso machine like you do now? Or do we have to go to your house first? Or do we yeah, just have to go to your house first? Yeah. <laughs> um, they are giving, Shakespeare and Company is giving all of you out there 10% off on Band of Sisters or any of the new releases from us here at Friends and Fiction with the code Friends and Fiction, but spell out the word and, all one word. And you can find a link and the info under announcements or on our Facebook page. And please y'all let's support our indies as we start heading out into the world. Absolutely. Okay, so I know there are a lot of live questions. We're running a little short on time. So maybe Lauren, if you would, maybe you could stop back in later if you have a chance sometime later this week to answer. There, there are just a lot of questions oh, coming absolutely. in. Absolutely. I will go and type out answers to you guys. That is fantastic. fantastic. Thank you. So Thank if you have more questions, feel free to keep putting them in and I will keep sure. typing. Oh, Lauren, that's amazing. Thank you so much. Thank um, you so much for having me. Well, we still have a couple questions for you. We're not getting, we're, we're not, we're not letting you go yet. You're, you're still stuck with us for a few more minutes. So every week, one of our favorite parts of the show is receiving a writing tip from our guests. Do you have a writing tip you can share with us perhaps about how to write a chapter a day in a, yeah. in, in a panic and to churn out a book in a few weeks? Because I mean, asking for a friend I, that has nothing to do with anything I have coming up in the next couple of months. <laughs> Well, that's an easy one. Nespresso. Um, <laughs> Nespresso is right our thing. new sponsor. Say, like, we should, can we send them this episode and like kind of see? <laughs> yes, please. We have to like put little ads for our books on the pods, or even right. better, the yeah. oh, pods right. after our Great books. Idea. Oh, that's funny. Like the sold on Monday coffee flavor. Exactly. I like it. I like it. <laughs> Happening on Tuesday. Um, but it's called shaking on a Wednesday. <laughs> So the English wife, the English blend. Um, yeah, thanks. No, but actually, my my best writing advice is always ignore advice. That I don't think there's any right or wrong way to do this crazy thing we do, and that the only way to learn what your method is is by trial and error, by just flinging yourself at it until you figure out what works for you. And I've always been very glad that I didn't go to any writer's conferences until after my first book was already out and I ran my second because I got to my first one and learned I've been doing everything all wrong for oh, wow. years. But by then I was so sad in my bad habits, I just continued with it. So I think the important thing is to know that there really is no right or wrong, that your method, whatever it is, if it's right for you, it's right. And just go on with it and don't try to twist yourself into anyone else's ideal writing style or schedule. Your way is your way. I love that. Absolutely. I always joke with, you know, when I'm talking to high schools or about, you know, creative writing and this and that, right? And I always say that almost every story has been told, right? If, if, if Shakespeare didn't cover it, you know, then Greek mythology did. So it's all about, especially with fiction, right? It's all about your voice and how you tell the story and not to worry if something else has been written already because goodness knows, yes, it has, it, it's been written. So so putting your spit on it is the most important thing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so for my, my advice on that, I'll chime in is, um, you know, the most important thing I ever learned, and I, I learned this after I wrote the whole first draft of my first book. <laughs> I was unfortunate to get the best advice on the last page. And that is um, goals, motivation, conflict. So G and C is what we call that, of course. And, and that is what turns the pages, right? Is that you have, they want something, why can't they have it? 
and um, why do they want it? Did I repeat all that? <laughs> so, um, and so for me, I think that the, the biggest thing that turns the pages right is conflict and uh, raising questions. And then as soon as you answer a question, then raise another one. And that's how, mm. it, isn't that just the most irritating thing at that, that movie at two in the morning? You, it's terrible. And you cannot go to bed because they've raised a question that you need to know the answer to before you can sleep. And then you turn it off and go, I should have gone to bed. But it doesn't matter because you watch the whole thing through. So anyway, so hopefully you don't feel that way about my books, but <laughs> there you go. Chris, Lauren, do you have a book you might want to recommend for us? Something you are just loving and reading? Something you want to tell us about? Well, sure. Right now I am reading Ellie Griffith, The Zigzag Girl, which is oh, I like that title. Book. Right, right. I know you said it's very catchy, but the funny thing is I've avoided this book for years because I adore her Ruth Galloway mystery series about a forensic archaeologist on the Norfolk coast who's always getting mixed up in crime because my not so secret ad addiction is British murder mysteries. I found it really strangely soothing, particularly during the pandemic. It's like someone's like some British person will be murdered, a detective will be called and the crime will be solved. Yay. It's very relaxing. Um, but I have, for some reason, I avoided this particular series by her for years because I'm like, it's set right after World War II in Brighton. There's like magic shows involved. It just didn't sound like my thing. And so I finally, because mysteries, murder mysteries have really been getting me through the pandemic. I've run through so many. I'm like, fine, I'll try the Brighton mystery series. And it's really good. So I highly recommend for other, you know, junkies of British television. This is like Endeavor meets Foils War. <gasps> my favorite meets show. Ranger. Endeavor is my favorite show of all. So I can't wait for another nice. series. I keep checking to be like, when is the next series I coming know. out? And every time they have one, I know they're going to say there's not another one. And then there is. But eventually he's going to catch up to to Inspector Morris and they're not going to have any more. I know. And I find the Morrises so deeply unsatisfying. I actually made the mistake of trying to read one of the original Morris mysteries and I was fascinated by how deeply male chauvinistic it was. And then I went yeah. back to watch, I, I like, I love Endeavor and Lewis, Endeavor. but the Morses, you know, even though they spawned the others, I find really hard to either read or watch. That's crazy. Oh, so uh, uh, Christina, do you have a book you'd like to recommend? Yeah, you know, there's one that I got to say that I am cannot wait to read now that I will about, about to finish my book. Um, and it is, an, an, of course, historical because I get so excited about those um, by two friends. So Heather Webb and Hazel Gaynor, which I'm sure you guys are all friends with. Um, yes. and, and they just had a brand new book come out. So speaking of collaborations, those two write amazing books together. And it's They're another awesome. historical sister story, Europe. You know, it's going to be fabulous. And it's called Three Words for Goodbye. So everybody go check that out because I cannot wait to read it myself. Yep. So good. I, I get I uh, get a chance to read it early in Blurb it and it was absolutely Aww. fantastic. So yes, you are in for a treat. You are absolutely right. Christy, did you have a book you wanted to mention also? Um, yes, I just wanted to mention... Um, Allie Larkin's uh, The People We Keep came out this week. And um, Ron and I got to interview her for the most fabulous podcast episode. So you guys need to definitely check that out when it comes out. But um, the book opens with um, a girl uh, hot wiring a car to get to an open mic night. So basically, I was hooked from page one. And I was like, what is this? And um, just her story about this story absolutely was breathtaking. So um, everybody needs to check it out. It's a great book. And the podcast episode was fantastic. Talk about hitting on the goal motivation conflict on page yeah. one, Christina yes. McMorris. Yeah. I mean, yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. I can't oh, wait to read that. Awesome. I know. What's, what great recommendations this week. This sounds wonderful. All right, Christina, Lauren, everybody, please stick around. We have one final thing to ask Lauren, but first a few messages from us. We always want to remind you, and Christy just mentioned it, about our podcasts. We have the Friends and Fiction Writer's Block podcast, and we will always post links under announcement each time a new one comes out. It is so much fun because it's totally different from the show, and we interview people on Fridays, and we have Ron Hones in on memoir writing this week with authors Y2 Moore and Lisa Donovan. That drops on Friday. And wherever you get your podcasts, you can find these. Last week, they interviewed Jean Hamp Corlitz, who wrote The Plot. 
and the book was a Jimmy Fallon summer read pick. We are going to have people like Zibby Owens, Christina Lawrence, Stephen Rowley, Amy Jo Burns, and so many more. One easy way to listen online, if you don't already listen regularly, is to just go to the Friends and Fiction website and click on the podcast link, and you can listen straight off your computer. You don't even have to get fancy and pull out your phone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to remind everybody about all of our fabulous Friends and Fiction merchandise um, that is available either through our website or um, it takes you over to Oxford Exchange. They have a whole Friends and Fiction section on their website with t-shirts and wine cups and tumblers and all kinds of good stuff. And we are getting ready to um, roll out a really amazing new Friends so of Fiction exciting. product. So exciting. We cannot wait to tell you about. And we're pretty sure that you're going to want to get it for everyone on your holiday list. But speaking of your holiday list, do you know that Patty, Mary Kay, and I all have winter books coming out? Mary Kay's The Santa Suit, Patty's Once Upon a Wardrobe, and My Christmas in Peachtree Bluff. You can um, order them in partnership with Nantucket Book Partners and um, they'll you know come to you on their pub day or right as soon as they come out and you get an exclusive friends and fiction coffee mug and branded hot chocolate and it's the only place you can get those so um, it's good winter reading for you know keep you cozy and there is this video we made this exclusive oh, yes. video and oh. you get the QR code with this subscription and you Thank can you watch guys. This little video we made together um, where we tell behind the it's scenes over. secrets in Christie's living room. So, and of <laughs> course, if you're not hanging out with us yet in the Friends and Fiction official book club, you are completely, totally, utterly missing out. The group, which is separate from us and is run by our friends, Lisa Harrison and Bredna Gardner, is now eight thousand members strong and this Friday they will be hosting a happy hour with our writer's block podcast host and rock star librarian Ron Block and then on August 16th Kristen will be joining the Friends and Fiction Book Club to discuss her astounding book The Forest of Vanishing Stars which of course came out last month. They have plenty more fun events in store so if you haven't joined hop over to the Friends and Fiction Official Book Club. Next week, join us right here at 7 p.m. again on Wednesday at 7, I already said at 7 p.m. <laughs> 7 p.m., that's it. That's Drinking. it. I'm having water and I can't get the time. Um, <laughs> it's gonna be Taylor Jenkins Reid, who we're so excited to host, the author of Daisy Jones and the Six and this summer's huge hit, Malibu Rising. I will also be giving you, I forgot about this, a sneak peek at the brand new cover <laughs> you of forgot. my- Oh God, I got to get that together. Of my 2020 <laughs> The Wedding Veil and a chance to get a free gift if you pre-order. So you won't want to miss it. And if you're ever wondering about our schedule, it's always on the Friends and Fiction website, as well as the sidebar of events on our Facebook page. And to learn more about our individual online and in-person happenings, make sure that you subscribe to the Friends and Fiction newsletter, which you can do from the landing page of friendsandfiction.com. And now that we're almost wrapped up, Lauren, you have one more question left before you go, and it is not hemorrhoid related, so you should be relieved. <laughs> okay. Everybody's been hanging out, though, staying on the show for that. Okay. So, so I have a question for you that I know all the ladies here want to know, and that is that we are really, really interested in um, what were the values around reading and writing in your childhood? So what books did you grow up with and how important were those? Oh my gosh, well, I grew up surrounded by books, you know, sort of, as you can see behind me, the interior decoration scheme is where can we stick more books? Um, <laughs> I grew up on a lot of, well, I grew up reading things that were inappropriately way too old for me. I got my hands on my first romance novel, Mary Lyde's Anne of Cambrai, set during the civil war between Stephen and Matilda in England when I was seven years old, because I had read, um, Oh gosh, I'm like, yeah, I'm E.L. Konigsberg's A Proud Taste for Scarlet and Miver about Eleanor of Aquitaine and fell in love with her and pestered everyone for anything that might have anything about Eleanor of Aquitaine in it. Yeah. And once I maxed out yeah. on my school's library's biographies of Eleanor, my father went and handed me Anne of Cambrai. And that was just it. I moved on from there to Jude Devereaux and Joanna Lindsay. So I was the first grader on the school bus going back and forth between Nancy Drew and Twin of Ice, Twin of Fire. So, or like, oh, oh my goodness. Amazing. So, you know, although to the 
pure. All things are pure. There was so much that totally went over my head. But my parents' reaction to this when other parents would be like, oh my God, why are you letting her read like Sweet Savage Love? Was <laughs> we don't care what she's reading as long as she's, she's reading. reading. Although they did <laughs> talk a little at Sweet Valley High. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that was my favorite. That's Christy's that favorite. favorite. Oh, that was my and, favorite too. Yes, love it. And mom wouldn't let me read the last two. Like some, it was the something and the morning after. I wasn't allowed to read those. Oh, well, I think oh. that tells you why. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's I mean, I have to say, like, I think I feel like Sweet Valley High was way above my head in so many levels. Unlike, you know, Kathleen the Widowist, like 18th century romantic drama was one thing. But I remember there was this line in one of the Sweet Valley Highs where it was like she had found some pot hidden in the drawer. I'm like, they must have broken a china pot. Yeah, and, like, I don't it. remember that. It wasn't all. until years later. I was like, oh. That's what they were talking about. Oh my God. Isn't that, that is funny awesome. when, when you read stuff a little too early and you think yeah. you get it and your mind just fills in. Oh, I, I love yeah. that. Or my but, other favorite was like in one of those <laughs> romance novels where there was this extended metaphor as only like Kathleen E. Woodowice and those 70s and 80s writers could do about waves crashing on a beach. And I, of course it was all about, you know, it was sex. But I was like... When did they go to the beach? How did I miss this transition? <laughs> I'm flipping back trying to figure out how they got from the castle to the beach. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah. And on that note, I just think that is the perfect way to perfect. close out our show. So to yeah. all of you out there, we encourage you to grab Lauren's latest novel, Band of Sisters, hopefully from our bookseller of the week, Shakespeare and Company on Lexington Avenue in New York. Lauren, thank you so much for dropping by to talk about your new book, your writing life, all the amazing things you have going on, and just sharing so much. Yeah. This was just fun. I think I've smiled the entire hour. I know my Oh my goodness. Well, thank you so much. It is always such joy. And thank you so much to Christina Wick Warris for you know, co hosting. W. <laughs> oh, All right. So thanks, Lauren. Bye. 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 Thanks for coming. All right, everyone, we so deeply appreciate you joining us. This community means so much to each and every one of us, and you all out there are at the heart of it. Christina McMorris, a huge thank you to you for filling in for Mary Kay tonight. We adore you in every way and cannot wait to have you back again with us. Thank you. This was so fun. You know that I would have loved to have done this for the last year, but my book would have been coming out two years later yes. instead of one year. I, so I this is a treat. Thank you. Well, we are so glad to have you here, but do not leave yet because we have a few questions for you on our Sip and Stay with StoryPoint after show. So to all of you out there, stick around to hear a bit more from Christina just after the credits roll and make sure to come back next week, same time, same place as we welcome Taylor Jenkins Reid. Meanwhile, don't forget to check out our podcast, our Winter Wonderland subscription, and all the fun going on on our Facebook page. See you in 30 seconds. Good night. Good night. Thank you for tuning in. Join us every week on Facebook or YouTube, where our live show airs every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And please subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here. Good night. Well, hello again. Welcome hello. to our Friends in Fiction Sip and Stay with StoryPoint after show. As we mentioned earlier, we are so happy to be partnering with StoryPoint Wines as the official sponsor of our after show. All summer long, it will be the summer of StoryPoint here on Friends in Fiction. As they say at StoryPoint, many great stories and ideas unfold over a shared bottle of wine, including Friends in Fiction. <laughs> So every Wednesday night, right through the end of August, we hope you'll stick around for these after shows to sip and stay with story points. Absolutely. Now, Christina, we are so grateful that you joined us tonight. And of course, we'll be having you back soon, but we thought it would be fun to play a quick game of what's your story with story points. We have six rapid fire questions for you so that our viewers can get to know you a little bit better. So here goes. All right. Which one of your main characters is the most similar to you and why? Most similar to me and why? Let's see here. I think 
gosh, I don't know about you guys, but it's probably a combination of characters. Isn't it? I think there's a little piece of me in like each character. And I know probably book clubs ask you that a lot, isn't it? That is, is especially the female characters. They'll think, is, was that one inspired you. by yourself? Exactly. Yeah. And I usually yeah. go, no, it was the guy. <laughs> like, I think that I tend to be more of the male characters in a lot of my stories. Um, and I think it's because growing up in, especially in high school, all of my almost all my close friends were guys. And I loved that. They, they were all like my brothers. And, and so because of that, I love that quick humor and the sarcasm mm -hmm. and, and, um, and so, yeah. So I think I relate more to them probably more than anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Christina, which one of your books was the hardest to write? <laughs> maybe hmm. right let, me, let me think about that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The current one, the only book that has taken me more than a year to write. So okay. I, I, yeah, this book was, and oh my gosh, Patty, you make me feel so much better when I knew that Saving Savannah, I think took two years, right? Oh, Surviving Savannah was this deep dive that every time I thought I was done, I'd find something else. It took a little over two years for yeah. sure, Christina. There, that was no, like we were talking about her writing a chapter a day you know, I would get oh halfway through a chapter, freeze frame, take yeah. another rabbit hole, freeze frame. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. The rabbit yeah. holes are insane. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how to get anything done. Yeah. And then find out that one you come across, right? One nugget that you go, that's wrong. And yes. you know, yep. that, that they couldn't have used that location on yep. that estate. You know, they stopped using it two years yes. earlier. Yes. And you're like, yes. you, and you go, can I, can I fudge it? Can, oh, but you, you know, you can't, you're no, going to get a letter. No, no. You're going you to get a letter. And you can't unsee it, you know, and you work so hard at everything else. You go, really, yes. am I going to let that go? Yeah. And, but yeah. yeah, of course. So of course, uh, yeah. And the most com in the story for me, most, and I know your research was crazy. Most research, m like the amount of research I put into this one for each section, there's four sections of the book and each one was enough for an entire novel. Oh, so it was, wow, and it's in four, it's a couple different countries and it's three different countries. Yeah, throughout the book, all during a time wow. that I was familiar with, but not in, those, not in those areas. So like the Netherlands, it goes into Dutch resistance and things that I had no idea about. So super exciting yeah. to look back at how much I learned, but as we all agree, if we had known what we were getting ourselves into, <laughs> Yeah. We never would have agreed. So it's good that I didn't know. Well, what is so great is that I get to pick it up, read it over the course of a week, and learn everything that you did in two years. <laughs> so true. Fabulous. Yeah. It's exactly right. Right? right? Those but I, really annoying readers that are like, I oh, I couldn't put it down. I mean, they were wonderful. We love them, but couldn't put it down. I, I read it in a day, and you're like, really? And you're like, really? No. Yeah. That day. consumed my life for at least two like, years. I spent a day researching that one fact right now. Yeah, that sentence, yes. exactly. The yeah, color of his jacket. Yes. And then took it out. And then yes. took it of out. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay, so which of your books was the easiest to write? Oh my gosh. Okay, well, there's probably, I could say two um, that were equal in different ways. One was Letters from Home, my very first debut novel. And I will say, the, the easiest part of it was when I, cause I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah, so right. I, I wrote the entire book in four months, World War II. <laughs> like, the research, interviewing people, everything. Because when you're blissfully ignorant and you don't realize what a bad draft it is, you, you can cruise. <laughs> That's right? what I learned. You can write really fast when you are very- Your fingers are flying, man. You're just <laughs> you're like, like that, that sentence is awesome. And then you're like, no, not so much. No, no, yeah. looking back, it's not awesome. <laughs> Lots of not awesome in that. Um, so, but then, you know, another year of cleaning and learning and, you know, going, oh, Oh, okay. I really didn't know what I was doing. Okay, good. Um, and then, other than that, picture book. Oh my gosh, they're the best. We, oh. you should all stop writing historicals. You too, Christy. <laughs> and we all just this is where it's at, people. Picture books. You can write it in a day. <laughs> it's so thrilling. So I have a picture book that's coming out next year with my sister because you know she's amazing, amazing artist, and it's always been her dream to do to uh, illustrate awesome. picture books. And then we sold it in two book contracts. So I think they're changing the title or I'd share it with you, but I'll share it with you when it's, when it's ready. And she's just turning it in today. Like oh, the, the, the artwork is done. It is so beautiful. Her work is gorgeous. And I can't it's wait. such a cute little story. And I'll just tell you the, the quickest version of it is that a little girl who, um, as we all know that question at school, what do you want to be when you grow up? Mm -hmm. This is that story with a twist. So she cannot make decisions to save her life, which my my oldest son would spend like an hour and a half, two hours in front of the Chuck E. Cheese prize counter. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> 
because which of these really cheap toys do you want to take home? You can only do one um, and it breaks on the way home. So yeah. oh, <laughs> always, always, always. So, so she can't make her decisions. So she ends up melding and mashing careers. So she's heard the moon is made of cheese and she also wants to be an astronaut. So she is going to make the best galactic grilled cheese sandwiches ever and sell them in a fly through to aliens. So these are the kind of things that she comes up with. It's very fun. That's awesome. I love it. Okay, so Christina, what's the biggest challenge you face when you sit down to write? <laughs> Everything. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> um, blank page. Blank yep. page is my hardest thing. I love to edit so much. Um, oh, and that's I, so crazy. Right. I mean, I'm like, we need to, if that's not your thing, Patty, we need to pair up because we, we need can, to co-write. We could be a machine. Say, you need to pair up with me because I would me. love to cruise on that blank page. I just page. cruise <laughs> on the blank page, man. Yeah, that so editing. Envious. Oh my gosh. I'm so envious. Yeah. I love the editing part. And the bummer is that usually that's when the time is crunched, right? Yeah. And you have to yeah. now edit. I'm editing this 560 page monster <laughs> it was that I planned to be 330 pages. That's, that was my plan. Yeah. Um, and, but the stories, as you, Christy says, it's just, it's a big story. I mean, it was yeah. crazy me to think I could shove it all in there in 300 pages. So um, yeah. So uh, yeah, we can, we can work this out, you know, Patty C and the Christie's we, we may have like a little book. <laughs> like tag <laughs> team it, a little rotation. Yeah. I mean, just see that on the oh. cover. Because I mean, you do the research because you're really good at that. <laughs> Maybe it's not a band. Maybe it's a book. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I like yeah. it. I'll edit all day long. <laughs> it's a deal. Christina, where is your favorite place to write? Uh, favorite place to write is, oh my gosh, it's back in my office, which, yes. which is also part of why this book, I think, took a long time because I lost it for a year. You know, so I, oh, wow. because we all had different rooms in the house yeah. and, um, and both my boys did online charter school this past year, which it turns out, you know, their, their high school did all online last year as well. So yeah. we could kind of see it coming. So we decided to go with the school that had, 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 had it down for 15 years, yeah. 20 years, yeah. they knew how to do yeah. online school. Um, so it worked out great, but it meant that everybody was in a different room. And my husband started working out of the house a month before the pandemic. So before the shutdown. So everybody's got like a section. So I gave up the office um, for oh, my youngest so he could have space, which was great. But I didn't think it affected me until he got done with school and I moved back in here in June and I'm riding so much faster. And I realized oh, wow. that was part of the problem. I was sitting on a couch. I was way too comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I was kind of like, I think editing, I would have been okay, but not writing from scratch. That yeah. I was yeah. way too distracted. Yeah, That makes sense. Fascinating. So I want to know, one thing yeah. that you want to accomplish with a book or in your writing career or something you haven't written about yet that you're maybe terrified to write about mm -hmm. and any of those you haven't accomplished yet that you really want to accomplish? That's a good question. I think besides all of us wanting to see our, our books as movies, which they'll yeah. all become yes. very yeah. soon. <laughs> yes. yes. I mean, with all, these mouth, God dear. Yeah. Right? with all these streaming services, they're going to have to run out of books pretty soon, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. Come find us. Come find us, right. So besides that idea, of course, pie in the sky, that would be so fun, right? That was so fun. Um, aside from that, let's see here. I would probably, I am very tempted, and I almost did that instead of the current book, was to write a story that had to do with, like, a ghost story. Oh, and fine. it's one of those ones that I just love them. Um, I grew up in a house that seemed to be at one point haunted. Uh, we actually, you know, got a, I don't know if I ever told you this, did I? About a mask that we were given a family as a gift. And it turns out no. later it was from Haiti, <laughs> which we didn't know. And so who knows what they done with oh the mask. Gosh. Weird things started happening in our house. And um, it Whoa. was like where you get, um, it would sound like Tons of people were walking around upstairs like a party where the house is suddenly like footsteps all over and nobody was home or the, the lights would go on and off. The TV would turn itself on, which there were no remotes back then. You know, so it was yeah. weird things like that. You could feel hot and cold uh, spots in a room. And oh, whoa. And like a, like a, like we were in the water, like a pool and you go hot and cold. Wow. That's how it felt in the room. So finally, my we didn't know what to make of it. So my uh, we didn't know about the mask at the time. So my mom had a, our family pastor come to the house and he uh. saw it. And he was like, that's kind of weird. Where would you get? That? I think you might want to get rid of that and kind of get a bad feeling. We prayed in all the rooms at the time and it went away. 
And we found out a couple years later, no. our neighbors had had the same thing happening at the same time as us and it stopped at the same time. So oh, wow. that is a good story. That is, a good that is fascinating. Oh my gosh. Well, Christina, we are so happy that you joined us tonight. This was so much fun. And I love that we used the after show tonight to ask you questions. This was so much fun. Those so were, fun. Yeah. Yeah. That was, was a couple things I didn't know about you. So that was, mm -hmm. um, that was really cool. So thank cool. you so much, Christina. And, and Lauren was great tonight. I just think we had a, a wonderful night. Yep, it was fun. really fun. My face is smiling. Oh, yeah. 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 It was so yeah. fun to have you, Christina. Like just to have you as the as our as our fourth host. Oh, oh, so, so, fun. Fun. so fun. I'd love to be back. I miss you guys. Yeah. We, we miss, miss you, you too. So good luck with the rest of the book. I know you're going to turn it in. It's all going to be good. I cannot wait to hear what your editor thinks. Oh my gosh. And um, thank you. And everybody out there, we will see you all next Wednesday next week. at 7 p.m. Eastern. Good night. Good night. Good night, good night everyone.